And um, this product is a kind of new type of headphones named Neuron. And you can see they look a little bit strange because they have not only the cup but also earbuds. And what they can do is that they can tune to your hearing. So when you put them on, you have a little calibration process, you press a button, it sends all sorts of weird sounds to your ear, and you just wait. And after about a minute, it had, find, it had basically determined your hearing profile and can create your own personal equalizer. Because we all hear differently, just like we see differently, or we have different fingerprints. But so far, nobody was really doing that. So it's all integrated. They also went on Kickstarter, it's a team from Australia. They raised almost $2 million on, uh, initially on Kickstarter, and then raised uh, virtual capital uh, over $20 million. They're doing quite well, got really good reviews. Interestingly, technology comes from a medical field. Um, it's a technology used to test the hearing of babies, um, newborns. Because, you know, if you ask, oh, did you hear that, the baby is not going to tell you. So, what happens is that it's used, it's a devi there's devices that use a phenomenon called autoacoustic emissions, which is the signal your brain sends back to your ear on eardrums after hearing a sound. So, sound comes in, no, no, the signal goes to your brain, brain processes it, sends it back, modified of course by your hearing, and then your eardrop acts a little bit like a speaker, but very faint sound comes out. So you need very sensitive microphone to pick it up. And one of the founders of Neura is a, an ear surgeon. So he was very familiar with the technology, also happens to be coding firmware, so, you know, some people have multiple skills. So that's another example of showing that crossover between different fields can bring really interesting innovations. So the future, you can see, is around science, but also around software. It, of course, the signal processing of all this is really important. I'll give some more examples. So this is the our headphones. A few months after having launched the headphones, people started to say, oh, okay, headphones are great, but you know, these days, a lot of headphones have noise cancelling. You guys don't have it. Why don't you have it? They said, you're right. They did a, soft, they did a firmware update over the air, and they added noise cancelling to the headphones they had already sold. They also added a new mode that they call transparency, where they can regulate the amount of sound you hear from the outside, so you're not entirely isolated. Because with the, when you add earbuds, caps, and noise cancelling, you're really pretty isolated from the outside. So sometimes you actually want to hear what's going on and want to allow that to be filtered. So it's an example of product that actually gets better after you bought it, thanks to software. Another company actually from Germany called Bragi, they were one of the pioneers of uh, wireless earphones. They also offer a number of functions um, that are thanks to software. Um, they call themselves smart hearables. Um, they add features like filtering of the outside sounds, activity tracking embedded. Um, they even have a function that picks up any language you hear and connect to an app that basically tells you what you just heard to help you when you're speaking in a foreign country. Um, interestingly, I, I just talked to them in Copenhagen where, where, where I was uh, a few days ago. And they said, well, actually, we're moving into more, doing more and more software. So what we did with our hardware is essentially kind of proof of concept with 200,000 units, which is kind of crazy, but also shows the prevalence of software in the future of audio, and probably, as you've seen on the trade show, also on imaging. Another example of software and audio, this is, you can say, kind of a, a smart speaker, but it not, doesn't actually speak. It's a device that listens to what a child or baby is saying in the first years of language acquisition to help the parents figure out if the child is learning language fast. Language is really important, that's how you learn everything else. So it can count the number of conversations you're having, it can recognize each word to understand the diversity of vocabulary, and it can basically guide you so that you have more meaningful, more interesting uh, conversations and engagement with your child to help them with language acquisition. So that's basically natural language processing for language acquisition. 
A few other examples, I'm talking about specialized things. So you might be familiar with EEG, electroencephalography. So it's basically you know, tracking the brain signals. Typically it goes like this, not very comfortable. But some companies decided to take that technology and adapt it for consumers. So here's an example, a company called Mindset in Canada that created smart headphones that improve your concentration. They can track your focus and tell you when you're actually getting distracted. Another company also using EEG called Cocoon, this time they track whether your brain is active or falling asleep to help you with sleep. And they also have a particular design to have something comfortable you can actually keep while you sleep. A company from the UK. Talking about sleep, I'm going to take a step in a different direction now, not talking about audio, but looking instead of a looking at a particular field, looking at a problem, a problem of sleep. Because sometimes, you know, when you have technology, you try to find a solution, but you try to find a problem to work on, but the other way is you really start with the problem and to find a different solution. So for sleep, there's actually a lot of solutions to the problem. How can we help sleep? So at Hacks, we actually invested in five different companies dealing with sleep. I mentioned Cocoon, Headphones for Sleep, and I'll show you some other examples uh, of a Luna that does temperature control for sleep, Sana, a mask to help you fall asleep within 10 minutes, another one doing advanced sleep tracking, and last one, a snoring treatment. So maybe you heard that curse, uh, may both sides of, of your pillow be warm, so it's uh, probably the worst thing that can happen. It's actually a, the reason we flip around the pillow when we try to sleep is because our head is too warm. And uh, that also guides the, the temperature of our body uh, that prevents us from falling asleep. So this company from France created a thermostat for your pillow, where you can actually control the temperature. And um, tracking your movement, they can also adapt it whether you're falling asleep or waking up. The time you wake up, if you're actually too cold, you're going to be very groggy and sleepy. So they warm up in the morning and they cool you down at night. Sana, uh, the mask um, I mentioned uh, you, that uh, help you fall asleep, they use a, a mix of uh, heart rate variability tracking as well as lights or sound patterns to help you fall asleep. As it turns out, it was very difficult to get visibility in the sleep market because there's so much crap out there. People have started to kind of be very cautious and lose faith in uh, people making claims. So they decided to actually refocus their technology towards what they actually made for, which is pain relief. The founder uh, is a man who was in a very bad car accident in his 20s and ended up in a wheelchair with chronic pain. And the doctors told him, Sir, you've been in a bad car accident with your chronic pain. You won't be able to sleep well. You probably have five years to live. So he was like, OK. So I need to sleep, right? So he read everything he could about sleep and he learned how to create his own product, his own prototype actually for many years um, that helped him um, you know, live a lot longer. And now finally some of the components became affordable enough to create consumer power. This is another product uh, that does tracking, so sleep tracking, there's a lot of sleep trackers, you have bracelets, you have things you put on the bed, it's all very precise. This one uses some kind of non-contact sensor that's similar to uh, sonar technology that can measure the mic your micro movements to understand your breathing and how you sleep this way. They did a little design pivot, but that's going to name. Uh, another company in the same field is uh, using similar technology, this time to track baby sleeps. And it's really important for parents because if you're parents, you probably always check if the baby's breathing to see if he's alive or if there's a problem. So it can help relieve parents of, of that anxiety using ultra wideband radar technology, the type that's used by submarines. 
won't go into the details of this one. Uh, it's currently in development, uh, but that's another aspect uh, to approach uh, sleep is to help with uh, sleep problems such as snoring. I'll end with a few uh, comments on uh, what we see in photography. Uh, you probably heard of Lytro, light field photography. Very interesting technology that struggled to really find a market due to the fact that you needed separate equipment that was actually expensive, that it, it didn't integrate well in the workflow. Raised over $200 million, got acquired by Google for about 40, so not that great. And that's one of the challenges we see when you have technology come out of, coming out of a lab, is figuring out the right market for that technology on the right user experience. Other interesting developments in, uh, in imagery, uh, you've probably seen that all around, is all you can do on, with uh, image processing, understand uh, you know, how to trigger, um, like so phones do that now, like you smile and it takes a picture. There's also other interesting developments around the VR aspect, uh, 3D environments. Uh, if some of you have tried the recent Oculus Go, it's actually, I think it's a game changer for that industry to pick up, because it's only $200 finally hit the right price point with good enough quality. Um, and that will connect well with devices like uh, this company, um, Orovis, which we invested in, that does capture 360 video with 360 audio with an array of microphones all around. And you can do sound stitching this way. Uh, there's devices like this AI selfie phone by a company um, from China named Meitu, the actually a public company worth about $3 billion now. This is what they can do, a picture, automatically. And last, uh, I mentioned also this one, because uh, I think it's also kind of significant development. Technology coming from kind of the drone, like image stabilization, now coming to consumers to create really professional video capture, uh, thanks to very affordable gimbal. Uh, they have a stand outside, I think, and it's, uh, I think, also really quite cool to have that now, consumer level. So in closing, for those of you building startups, um, understand that the level has gone up. You cannot just be you know, tinkering with off-the-shelf simple stuff. Now, generally, it requires quite a lot of science. Positioning and messaging are really important and very often neglected by technical founders. Who are you serving? What's your message? Make it super clear. Um, at the beginning, that might mean you need to explore different industries, talk to consumers, talk to professionals, talk to industry verticals, to understand their needs. Find the resources where they are. Maybe some in Germany, maybe not. Uh, you can probably find really good talent uh, for technical development in Germany, maybe for the first prototypes. But then for quick iterations, for productization, customers, you might need to look outside. Skills, so understand you need to learn a lot as a founder, uh, either by learning yourself, hiring people, or getting the right advice. Keep China in mind for building products. Um, recently I was discussing with a, um, the, the general manager of a kind of family company making industrial models. And he was saying that when they were trying to do the new prototypes, in France, they could only find two suppliers to do it. Um, they talked with them, and two months later, still nothing done. He said in China, he decided to move part of the R&D there because it moves so much faster. And he said, and it was a bit of a surprise, that maybe the future of industrial R&D is actually in China. Because the tools are there, and it's moving fast. At last, um, when you're a startup, also keep in mind that you can't get away with just making one product um, being set. If Apple had, sticked, had stuck with the, just the first iPhone, they would be outpaced by far right now. They kept innovating after the first product. So that's all I have. I'm happy to take some questions, uh, either here or on Twitter. Thank you very much. China. Quality control in China. Obviously a challenge. Uh, obviously it's possible to do it. Um, you know, China makes the latest iPhone, so it's doable. So quality control generally means that first you have to work with suitable partners who have the ability to do quality. But also you have probably to spend quite a lot of time on site with them 
so that they reach the level you want. Particularly when you do products that they've never done before, which is what startups typically do, you are the only one who knows what you want. So you have to be there to spend time on the production line, talking with the engineers to be able to fix things, and you have to document very clearly anything you want and what are your standards. And that's generally, I'd say one is, you cannot assume that what you consider quality or what a German factory engineer would consider quality is the same. Common sense is very local. So that, that would be my advice. Spend time with the factory, document the specs, document the quality, um, basically your quality requirements. And be on site to understand what is it you can ask, what is it you cannot, and maybe they can also help you find better ways to do what you want to do. Other question? Maybe not. Alright then. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Bigger quantities, better price, and negotiations. So in the beginning, like you get some samples, you work fine, you improve it, improve it, and you have the first hundred, five hundred, one thousand batch. But so scaling, yeah, price yeah. So like always, you start with a sample price, and mm -hmm. it's still very hard to understand what is actually their production cost and we could be on a target price. Yeah. So this is a good question on, on many aspects actually. So first. When you work with partners, you have to keep in mind that they also need to make money to be motivated. So the more you understand their sourcing, means having an open bomb, open bill of material, so that they don't obfuscate what costs what, and everything is clear, is really important. Second, when you try to identify partners, you have to figure out what is the level of motivation. Why do they want to work with you? When you're a startup, you're not, not really a good business. You don't have money, you don't have volume, you have some kind of interesting, new, cool thing. And some founders of factories, they try to make quick, quick money, and some others, they think more ahead, more in the future, thinking, okay, I'm going to work with a few startups, and maybe one or two of them are going to do well, and I'm going to grow with them. The other ones, well, maybe I'll waste a bit of my time, and it's going to be okay. So some of them really think like investors. They don't give you money, but they think like investors. Another thing is about volume. So when you start to have higher volume, then cash flow becomes an issue, in addition to pricing. So of course, pricing generally goes down when you have higher volume. Cash flow becomes an issue, because typically, if the standard is that you pay maybe 50% upon ordering and 50% when you get the product, so some of 30, 70. It's a problem for a startup. If you need to raise venture capital just to finance cash flow and inventory, it's a you know, dilution machine. It means the more you scale, the more dilution you will have because you can't finance your inventory. Now that's where, that's the second layer where factories really act like banks. Because if you have a better relationship with them, with the partners, then they can give you better terms. We've seen some factories that uh, let's say either you have a great relationship or they've worked with Walmart and they used to terrible terms and they volunteer to, to say, oh, pay me, you know, 50% uh, when I ship and 50% three months later. And then you can have positive cash flow because you can sell the products even before you need to pay the factory. And that saves, that can save your company. There's some companies that just go under, not because they don't have demand, but because they don't manage cash flow properly, because they don't have good terms uh, with the distribution or with the manufacturers. Please connect us to this kind of company. <laughs> Yeah, so the challenge there is is that, of course, there's thousands of factories and every product is different. So you need to do kind of your research. And what we do um, when we invest in companies and bring them to Shenzhen is we tell them how to identify suppliers, how to figure out the level of motivation, how to negotiate with them. Because you need to do your own due diligence to make sure it's suitable partner. You need also to build your own supply chain. And every supply chain is very specific to, um, to every startup. Like if you do something around imagery and you need optical components, 
we don't really have a lot of companies in our portfolio who already worked with optical component factories, but we can give you advice on how to figure them out and uh, what to look for. Yeah. All right, I guess it's done. Thank you very much.